So it is 1230. So we will begin with today. Um, just a little reminder of what we talked about on Thursday. Uh, the last thing we were talking about is uh, fermentation. So one of the pathways of pyruvate, if you don't have um, oxygen, animal cells will go to lactate, yeast cells can go to ethanol. So we looked at the reactions for that. And now we're going to step away from um, pyruvate and kind of take a big picture look at glycolysis in terms of regulation. So inside of our cells, most tissues at least, uh, glycolysis is continuously going on because we need ATP all the time. We need energy to live. However, the rate at which glycolysis happens inside the cell, that, that does change. Remember, we call that flux. And the rate at which we are doing a pathway is called flux. And so this flux needs to change based on what the organism is doing. So flux control, um, to really understand how it works, there's three different steps. One, we have to know the rate determining step of the pathway. So which enzyme um, is the rate determining step? And you can do this in vitro uh, by measuring delta G. Uh, in vitro, if you're not sure, means basically in a test tube. So you take these enzymes, um, separate them, and you can measure delta G. And we know from our previous talks this semester, Enzymes that are far from equilibrium can be potential control points. Two, we need to know any allosteric modifiers of the enzymes that catalyze rate determining step reaction. So the allosteric, an allosteric modifier is a molecule that is not used up during the reaction but can speed up or slow down the reaction. So to really understand flux control, we need to know how do we make our enzyme go faster? How do we make our enzyme go slower or even stop? So that, that will give us a good idea about flux. Then you have to do measurements in vivo. So in vivo means do experiments inside the cells. We need to know what levels of these regulators exist under different conditions? So once you understand the mechanism outside the cell, once you understand what molecules can interact with the enzyme outside the cell, we then need, need to bring it back into a cellular situation or do experiments in the cell rather, and just see, you know, under different conditions of the cell, what are levels of these regulators? Like if I starve the cell, do I see this regulator go up or go down? If I provide the cell with a lot of food, does this regulator go up or does it go down? So those are the ways that we can begin to unravel uh, different metabolic pathways and we can start to learn about flux. So here I have some, or I have all of the uh, steps in glycolysis. On the bottom left is our table with the reaction numbers, the enzyme names, delta G, not prime, and delta G. So remember, delta G, not prime is standard conditions, and delta G is um, non-standard or like quote, real conditions. So like conditions of, and what I mean by conditions, I mean concentrations of products and reactants. Reactants. So at standard, we set everything to one molar. The real is we are trying to like simulate, you know, here inside the heart muscle, what kind of, um, concentrations of uh, reactants and products do we have? And what is the delta G for that? 
So we do this and what we're looking for for possible control points of flux are those enzymes that are far from equilibrium. And so we're looking at the delta Gs and we're looking at things far away from zero. Um, so reaction one, minus 27, very far from zero. Minus 25 for reaction uh, three, very far from zero. Then reaction 10, minus 13, uh, very far from zero as well. What this uh, graph on the right is showing is just showing you like energy per step, like how glycolysis is all flowing downhill um, when you add up all the delta G. So we start at glucose very high and then it's, it's like a waterfall, right? Where water wants to go downhill molecules want to go lower in energy. So that is what is happening here. Now for our non-flux control points, the enzymes that are not far from equilibrium. So if you look at the enzymes closer to zero, these enzymes, they are um, very sensitive to uh, the intermediates in this pathway. Since they're close to zero and since they're reversible, they can easily go forward or backward depending on the buildup or of um, products and reactants. Reaction one, three, and 10 though are so far from equilibrium, they really can't go backwards, right? So any questions about the information presented on this slide? All right. So I just explained this, but why is it possible for delta G values to differ from delta G not prime values? They're looking at different things. Again, delta G not prime, standard conditions, everything's one molar, delta G non-standard conditions, kind of um, actually inside the cell, like the amount of products and reactants. The one of the biggest changes here is reaction four, right? So if you just look at standard conditions, reaction four is very, very unfavorable. But because of this idea of substrate channeling, where the amount of the concentration of product here is cut extremely low, like the product from Adelaide is in an extremely low concentration, which makes that reaction favorable. So looking at these delta G values, we can really start to understand how, excuse me, how substrate channeling can actually make these reactions favorable. All right, so we have three enzymes that are potential flux controlling enzymes of glycolysis. And PFK, reaction three, is the main one. And the logic is this, uh, hexokinase, reaction one, um, you actually don't need that in your muscles all that much. That is because the way that your muscles can get glucose easily is through the storage enzyme our storage molecule glycogen. So we might talk about glycogen today, depends on how fast we go. Uh, we did talk about this in Biochem 1, storage of glucose. So glycogen is how we store glucose and that's how muscles can get glucose easily. And we use a different enzyme than hexokinase to do this. So. If we want something to control metabolism, we want an enzyme that is used in all of glycolysis, so it's not hexokinase. Pyruvate kinase, reaction 10, that's the last step. So it would not make sense if this controlled flux because you're done anyways at this step. So if I want to control how fast glucose is going through glycolysis, it wouldn't make sense to put my valve um, at reaction 10. And by valve, what I mean is when you think about flux, 
Think about it like a water valve, right? You turn it to the right, more water comes out. You turn it to the left, water stops coming out. Flux is the same idea. So PFK, just logically thinking about this mechanism, is the one that is actually um, the controller of flux. So that's step three. So PFK is a very important enzyme when it comes to glycolysis, because this ultimately controls how fast we go through glycolysis. And because it's the control point, it has a lot of regulation with it. One, it's a tetrameric enzyme with R and T states. Uh, so hopefully you remember back from Biochem 1 when we talked about uh, R and T states of hemoglobin. We're going to use the same notation here, right? Where the tenth state is low activity, the R state is high activity. And we can regulate the speed of PFK through allosteric molecules. That's what's shown here on the right. So ATP. So actually, let, let me talk about what this graph is showing. On the y-axis, it's PFK activity, or how fast it's going. And on the x-axis is the amount of F6P, which is the substrate for PFK. All right, so ATP is an inhibitor. It will bind to the T state, which makes sense, right? So ATP, if you have a lot of ATP around, that means you are have a lot of energy. So you, you have a lot of energy inside your cell. Glycolysis is the process of making ATP. So if you have a lot of ATP, don't do glycolysis. We can use that glucose or something else. So ATP will inhibit PFK. However, a small amount of AMP will reverse this inhibition. So if you have 10% of the concentration of AMP compared to ATP, your reaction speeds up a lot. This is also seen with ADP. ADP can also reverse this inhibition. And also the molecule fructose 2, 6 uh, biphosphate. We'll talk about that later. Um, but fructose 2, 6 uh, bisphosphate is another molecule that reverses this inhibition. If you have no ATP, you can see PFK goes really fast. That's this blue line here, uh, very low ATP. Um, if you're very low ATP, the cell's in a very dangerous state because you need ATP to live. And so it makes sense why glycolysis is going like maximum speed because you need to replenish your ATP uh, very, very fast or you'll die soon. All right, so any questions about what is being shown uh, here? All right. So like hemoglobin, um, PFK also goes through uh, changes when it goes from T state to R state. So the way to look at this is that the T state, the off state is gonna be blue. The R state, the relaxed state is red. Um, the relaxed state is stabilized by binding uh, fructose 6-phosphate. In our image, here's fructose 6-phosphate. Okay, so when we bind fructose 6-phosphate, we wanna be in the R state. Therefore, to stabilize the R state, we, we have more or less two amino acids that have a big change in their position in the enzyme. First, let's look at arginine 162. In the T state, Arginine 162, remember, hopefully you remember your amino acids, arginine is positive. 
Arginine 162 is very far away from the binding site of F6P. However, when F6P binds, arginine 162 swings in and the positive arginine will interact with the negative phosphate. So you're, you're having this stabilizing effect. You're having this positive and minus come together, uh, which will favor the R state. In the T state, which is different, instead of arginine being there, we have glutamic acid 161. So in the T state, we're in the off state. So we have a glutamic acid there. So if any fructose 6-phosphate wants to bind, that negative phosphate is going to be right next to a negative uh, glue amino acid. So you're going to have repulsion, and F6P won't want to bind. When it switches to the R state, uh, glue gets out of the way and more or less goes to where arginine uh, 162 is. So you have this kind of switch, molecular switch to say what will bind or not. Over here, the ADP, that's just showing you um, how we can switch. So ADP, when it binds, it favors the R state and that's what it binds in. Uh, PGC, what PGC is, it's a man-made um, molecule that was used to get a structure of the T state. So it's a fake molecule, it's not in the body, but it's mimicking, I believe, PEP, uh, phosphoenopyruvate, if I remember right. And it's just there to mimic binding in the T state so we can get a crystal structure of the T state. And Remember what I said in Biochem 1 that apparently a lot of you memorized because in your test answers, you love to say this back to me, structure divines function, right? So by getting the different structures of this, we can start to understand what is happening when for PFK, what's happening in the T state, what's happening in the R state, how does that molecularly what's happening, how can we make sense of that? So those are the changes in the enzyme from the T to the R state. All right, so now that we talked about PFK, um, let's talk a little bit about flux itself in terms of PFK. Um, I'm gonna redo the writing on the bottom here because it's, it's um, cut off for you. There's a double arrow right there and it's gap plus D hap. Uh, this is an arrow gap plus D hap. And in case that's cut off, that's an R there. All right, so we talked about this concept at the very beginning of class when we brought up flux for the, uh, for the first time. But we can also control flux by this idea of cycling. Um, cycling is if I have um, a reaction like PFK, let's say PFK is doing the forward reaction I can slow down this flux if I have another enzyme, I'm gonna call that enzyme B for the time being, uh, we'll learn its name. So we have another enzyme going the reverse way. And so we, we really need this because PFK is irreversible. It can go forward but it can't go reverse. That's why it says like here, reverse is negligible, right? PFK only goes in one direction, but we have a second enzyme that actually can do the reverse reaction. And since we can turn that on and off, the reverse pathway is no longer negligible. We just have two enzymes controlling, one enzyme controls the forward, one, one enzyme controls the reverse pathway by speeding these up or down, we can change flux. That's what's being shown in the images to the right. So in A, we have the forward and reverse pathway more or less going the same speed. So we have low flux through glycolysis because we have one enzyme making uh, fructose bisphosphate 
and another enzyme doing the reverse. Well, in B, we have high flux because we have uh, the forward reaction turned on, but the reverse reaction turned off. And so we're speeding flux up by just turning off the reverse reaction. And like I said, we're gonna talk about this uh, more in depth, but the main player uh, that we really care about in the reverse is, is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate there, or FBPase. And when we talk about gluconeogenesis, the reverse of glycolysis, that's when we're gonna get into uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, how it works with PFK, and how these two systems are regulated together. All right, so any questions so far about flux, PFK, uh, anything at all? Okay, we'll move on then. So here's a little bit of a review that we just talked about. Why is PFK1 a good candidate to be regulated? So I'll give people like a minute or so um, to think about this, to review, get this in your mind again, see if you remember what I just said, um, and then I'll, I'll come back with the answer. So try to think of all the reasons why PFK is a good candidate. All right, so hopefully you had some time to um, think of reasons there. So it's mainly three different reasons why PFK is so good. Uh, one, delta G is far from equilibrium. So that is important for flux. Uh, two, uh, every cell uses it. So no matter where you are, what tissue you're in for glycolysis, you're gonna be using PFK. So that's a way we can just globally uh, inhibit or speed up metabolism. And it's in the middle of the pathway. I mean, it's not directly in the middle, but it's not the, it's not the last enzyme um, like we saw for pyruvate kinase. Um, so those reasons would make PFK a good uh, candidate to be regulated. So when you're looking at novel pathways, like non-glycolysis pathways, because there's a bunch of pathways out there and you're trying to figure out, you know, okay, what enzyme is going to be controlling flux? What enzyme is probably going to be most highly regulated? You want to keep these things in mind, like Delta G, where is it in the pathway? Uh, can some cells actually skip this part of the pathway? Um, so yeah, just, just keep all those things in mind.
All right. So here's another question. So we have pyruvate kinase. What is the advantage of activating pyruvate kinase, which is all the way down here, with fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, which is all the way up here? So we, we didn't talk about this really, but PK at the bottom there, if we have fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, that can turn on PK. So is it, this is kind of a, um, one of those critical thinking questions. So why do you think PK can be turned on with fructose 1,6 bisphosphate? I know there's not many of you here today, but do any of you have an idea as to the logic of that? Why would it make sense to have this go and activate that? Any ideas? Is it because pyruvic kinase activates the reverse reaction? Uh, it does not. Pyruvic kinase um, does not do the reverse reaction for uh, PFK. Low energy intermediate. Um, I mean, fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, eh, it's an intermediate. I don't know if I'd call it low energy, but, but why would that be useful? Let me phrase the question in a different way, maybe to, to get those juices flowing. If I turn on pyruvate kinase, does the speed of glycolysis, do you think, goes up or goes down? Yeah, uh, FBPase is the one that goes reverse. Yep. So let's say I said, okay, pyruvate kinase, you are activated now. Are things going to flow down metabolism? Like is flux going to increase? Or do you think they would go back the other way? Flux would decrease. So this way flux is decreasing. This way flux is increasing. So if PK is turned on, which way are we going? Increase. Yeah. Uh, PK is uh, not reversible. Yep. So if we turn that on, basically we are increasing flux. Yes. All right. And again, remind, remind me, which enzyme is most directly responsible for flux in glycolysis? What's that enzyme called again? Uh, F6P is the, um, is, yeah, it's a substrate. PFK is the enzyme, right? Okay, so here's the logic, right? PFK, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase all this. PFK determines flux. Right? It is the main control point. The product of PFK is fructose 1,6 bisphosphate. So the cellular logic is if PFK is on, that means the cell is low in energy. Because we, we looked at that graph where ATP turns off PFK, AMP turns on. PFK. So if it's on, that means it's low in energy, which means we want to run glycolysis. 
Well, another enzyme that works far from equilibrium is pyruvate kinase. And so the idea is I'm gonna go, and since, since fructose bisphosphate is around, PFK is on, which means we need to make energy. So I'm gonna go, if I'm fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, and wake up pyruvate kinase. And I'm gonna say, hey, the boss in step three is saying that we need to turn on. So pyruvate kinase, you need to turn on as well. And then pyruvate kinase turns on and it's gonna be this whole substrate channeling. Pyruvate kinase will take any PEP you have and make it pyruvate. And it's a chain reaction where you're gonna be pulling, oops, should be gap. You're going to be pulling all of your uh, intermediates through glycolysis, which in effect just speeds up glycolysis even more. And that is another way PFK is controlling the flux of glycolysis by having its product go and turn on another enzyme further down, further down the glycolysis pathway. Does that idea make sense? Um, or any questions about that logic of why we have one molecule further up the chain of glycolysis affecting an enzyme uh, below it? By below it, I mean just like in the order of the pathway. And hopefully you can get like, just by looking at this one interaction, you're kind of seeing how like regulated uh, the pro process of glycolysis is and how like interconnected everything is and how when you break it down, there's a lot of logic behind it of why different molecules interact with uh, different enzymes. It's not like random. It seems random the first time you study glycolysis, right? Like like, why does this molecule interact with this enzyme? And then when you take a step back, look at the bigger picture, ask yourself, okay, what does that molecule actually do? What does this enzyme actually do? You start to see, oh, it actually makes perfect logic of why this molecule, in this case, fructose bisphosphate, goes and interacts with pyruvate kinase. All right, um, so some further um, PFK, just do you remember what I said like 20 minutes ago now? So I'll give people like a minute or two, look back at your notes, refresh yourself. PFK is a big deal. So when it comes test time, I'm gonna ask you a lot about PFK. So make sure we can answer these. Um, I'll come back with like in a minute or two uh, to, to uh, give you the answers to this. But these are good. I'm going to ask you this in a couple weeks type of questions. So hopefully by this time, you've drilled it into your head. And when it comes to studying for the test, uh, it will be right there. PFK is the control point of glycolysis. So glycolysis makes ATP. So you want to activate it? That's low energy states. What's low energy uh, denoted by in the cell? AMP, ADP. Inactivate PFK1. I want to turn off glycolysis. 
when would I want to turn off glycolysis? When I'm high energy, when I'm full, I don't need to make energy. What lets me know I'm high energy? Well, ATP. If I have a lot of ATP around, that must mean I am well fed. I have a lot of energy. Don't, don't make any more energy, please. I'm good to go. Please store it as fat. Please store it as glycogen. All right, now we're gonna just look at how some other sugars are, um, are metabolized. And we're gonna start with fructose, evil, evil fructose. Actually fructose, it's good, it's in, in uh, fruits. It's just, you know, high fructose corn syrup. You, ate, you eat way too much fructose than you normally should. So you kind of throw things off there. But we're gonna look at the metabolism of fructose right now. And there's two different pathways. We have the muscle pathway, we have the liver pathway. The majority of fructose that you eat goes to the liver. Small percentage does go to the muscle. Um, muscle has hexokinase and hexokinase does work on fructose. So hecto, hexokinase is the same as, it's, it's, it's enzyme one of glycolysis, right? And luckily, it's, it's permissive enough to do fructose. So it does more or less the same thing as it does the glucose and it adds a phosphate to our six position, which makes fructose 6-phosphate, which goes directly into glycolysis. So muscles, it's easy. It's no extra reactions are needed for fructose. Liver, it's harder. I mentioned this in passing before, but liver doesn't have hexokinase. Liver has something else called glucokinase. And we're gonna learn later on in the semester. I know I keep saying that, but everything's connected, right? I'm, we're gonna learn later in the semester why we have glucokinase and not hexokinase. It's very important for keeping you alive. Um, but liver has glucokinase. Glucokinase can't work on fr uh, fructose. Wow, wow. So instead, what we do is we have fructokinase and what fructokinase will do, it will add a phosphate to our first, first uh, position carbon and make fructose one phosphate. Fructose one phosphate um, that can open up and close um, actually, any sugar can open up and close as long as you're not bound to anything. So fructose 1-phosphate, here we have the open chain form. And what can happen in the liver, you have another enzyme called fructose 1-phosphate adolase. And what fructose 1-phosphate adolase will do is that it will cut your fructose into two things. It will cut it into glyceraldehyde and it will cut it into DHAP, dihydroxy uh, acetone phosphate. So you're just basically cutting your fructose right in half. Once we're in glyceraldehyde, glyceraldehyde has two different fates shown by reaction three and reaction four. Glyceraldehyde kinase, and again, I'm gonna remind you of this because that shows up all over the place. When you see kinase, what you should be thinking to yourself is I'm gonna add a phosphate. So we burn an ATP to put a phosphate on the three position of glyceraldehyde to make gap glyceraldehyde three phosphate now we can go through glycolysis. Or what can happen is that we can take this glyceraldehyde, do a redox reaction on it. Again, anytime you see the word dehydrogenase, you know a redox reaction is happening. So alcohol dehydrogenase, the same thing that breaks down ethanol for you, will also work with glyceraldehyde. NADH going to NAD plus to make glycerol. 
those of us who remember what lipids look like, this is the backbone for a lipid, glycerol. So we can take this fructose, store it as fat, store it as lipids. So glycerol can leave there and go and make fat. But we can also break down that fat and make it back into glucose. So let's say we took fat, we broke it down and we remade glycerol. Now we cannot go reverse and make glyceraldehyde again. So we have some other, um, other enzymes. So we take glycerol kinase. So we have to burn another ATP and I'm gonna rewrite this molecule for you. CH two O P O two minus to make glycerol three phosphate. We can take this glycerol three phosphate and more or less do the reverse of what we just did in step four, right? Do another dehydrogenase, but this time make NADH to make DHAP. And we already looked at this reaction, but DHAP through triose phosphate isomerase can remake glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So that's how fructose can be fed into metabolism. And hopefully you can also see why um, fructose, like a very high diet of fructose um, can lead to obesity. Uh, one of the ways at least is that the fructose you, you eat is directly just made into fat in the liver. Um, and also fructose doing this, we, we kind of skip um, a regulation point for uh, glycolysis. Fructose in the liver doesn't have to go through step three, right? You just break it apart into, into glyceraldehyde and DHAP. So not only is fructose going to make fat through glycerol, it can also continue to go through glycolysis bypassing the checkpoint. Right, so that's why we we saw with with high fructose corn syrup why it can be so bad for us if you just eat way too much fructose. It's bypassing regulation and it's just going directly into fat through glycerol. All right, so any questions about our uh, fructose metabolism here? So do you want us to memorize each step? So you should be able to tell me fructose metabolism, yes. So for the muscle, it's hexokinase. Uh, for the liver, it goes to fructose 1-phosphate to glyceraldehyde plus DHAP. Um, glyceraldehyde can go through uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to glycolysis, or it can go through this other pathway. Welcome to the world of biochem 2 aka metabolism, aka I hope you're ready to memorize a bunch of steps. Those of you who want to go on to graduate schools, like if you wanna become an MD or something like that, welcome to baby graduate school. This class is basically that. Fun times. Like I said, I'm hoping, hoping some of this logic when we go through of it will help you remember it instead of just rote memorization. Maybe not, but that's the hope. All right, okay. So just two more sugars to talk about. Here, galactose, those of you who like milk, um, when you have lactose and you hydrolyze lactose, you make lactose. And lactose is just an epimer of glucose at C4. So if you don't remember what an epimer is, an epimer 
means that one chiral center is different. Everything else is the same. So if you look, all the other OHs are pointing in the same direction, except for carbon four. And this one difference is enough where galactose cannot be um, um, worked on by hexokinase. It's too different. Therefore, um, we have to have a whole nother pathway, yay, another pathway for us to take that milk sugar of lactose and digest it. So this pathway looks super confusing. Even though it's simple, it's still a little bit confusing. So let's go through it step by step. First up, we have a kinase, galactokinase. Again, the enzyme name is telling you what's going on, right? So kinase is adding a phosphate to galactose, galactokinase. That phosphate is coming through ATP. Right, so we're gonna make galactose one phosphate. So for this first go around, just look at the black images. Ignore the blue sugars for right now. So we're gonna take this black sugar and we're going down here with it, right? Ignore the blue ones for now. And through the enzyme, galactose one phosphate uridyl transferase. Again, it's telling you what it's doing. It's taking a gla uh, galactose one phosphate and adding UDP to it. So we take this, add UDP, which is this molecule, and we're gonna make UDP galactose. Actually, sorry, we're actually adding UMP because I forgot we already had a phosphate there, but we make UDP. Then what we can do, for whatever reason, it's, it's, it's interesting that evolution took this route. Once you're in the UDP galactose form, now you can make glucose. So we're gonna do UDP galactose for epimerase. And we're gonna take our carbon four, we're gonna flip it to make glucose. So, Epimerase is doing that for us. NAD plus is a cofactor for this. And we're not really, we're not doing any redox, even though NAD is there, it's just needs, needs to be there for the enzyme to work. Once we have UDP glucose, so there should be like a plus here. This UDP glucose is gonna take the UMP molecule, attach it to a separate galactose 1-phosphate molecule and form glucose 1-phosphate. Then we just need a mutase. And remember, a mutase is an enzyme that's just changing uh, functional groups where they're located. We're gonna take this one phosphate and put it on the six position to make glucose six phosphate or G6P. G6P is the um, molecule that's created at step one. Now we can go for glycolysis. So the recap, galactose goes to galactose one phosphate that interacts with a molecule of UDP glucose. The molecule of UDP glucose goes to glucose 1-phosphate, that's the blue. Galactose 1-phosphate goes to UDP galactose, that's the black. We change that UDP galactose into UDP glucose through an epimerase. And then that UDP glucose can interact with galactose 1-phosphate. So whenever, so when, when you're looking back I'm gonna erase some of these arrows. Uh, when you're looking back at this, what I want you to remember is that we are using two molecules here, right? 
this black plus this blue at the top make this new blue in this black. Then that black cycles around to make the blue UDP glucose, and then we have a reaction again. You keep doing that over and over and over again till all your lactose is used up. That is how you take lactose and make it into food, which all goes through glycolysis again. All right, questions about that? I'm lactose intolerant. Um, I don't think lactose intolerant comes from this pathway. I believe lactose intolerant comes from, well, you can be lactose intolerant if you don't have this enzyme, but I think lactose intolerant is mainly you don't have lactase, if I remember right. How many steps is this? So you have the first step of going galactose to galactose Lactose one phosphate. So that's step one. Let me get a different pen because I'm using black a lot. Step two is this crisscross pathway. Step three is going from UDP galactose to UDP glucose. And you just repeat step two. So I guess you could call this step two and step like four if you want to think of it that way. But it's really just step two because here they're numbering step four as glucose one phosphate to glucose six phosphate and then to glycolysis. So step two is always involving two molecules. I mean, I understand what they're going with that picture and it does make sense once you understand two molecules are being used at the same time, um, but it's a little confusing. But it's when, when you're reviewing this, it's black plus blue will make a new blue and black or galactose one phosphate. Let me, maybe this, let me write it out, gal one, phosphate plus UDP glucose makes glu-1-phosphate, G1P, plus UDP galactose. And this UDP galactose is remade into UDP glucose using our epimerase. Um, main and the actual names right there. So that, that's another way to write it out. Then glucose 1-phosphate goes through this path to make G6P. Then G6P goes through glycolysis. And I guess, let me just finish it off. Galactose is up here. Make glucose 1-phosphate through our kinase. So kinase, then we have a transferase an epimerase up there, and a mutase. So I do, and I, I've been trying to hammer it home. I do, I do hope that you're starting to get these enzyme names, what they actually do, because when you see those, it, it makes understanding a lot better. But yeah, that is a different way to write the pathway. All right, one last sugar, yay. This one's super easy though, mannose. Mannose is another epimer, this time at C2. So galactose was C4, mannose is C2. And the way that mannose is used is that one, mannose can be read into hexokinase. So hexokinase can use mannose and make mannose 6-phosphate. Then you just do an isomerase reaction. Remember isomerase is just changing the way things are bonded without adding or removing anything. So it just changes bonds, bond orders bond order. 
And so instead of a six membered ring, we're basically taking this bond and having it, um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I missed one. So we're not actually doing that. I went the wrong way, my bad. We're more or less taking this bond and then switching it. So you have the CH2OH group hanging out now by itself. Mainly you're going from a six member ring to a five member ring. And then fructose six phosphate can be read in metabolism. So super easy mechanism. All right, I think that ends our sugars. All right, any questions? about anything that we covered up to this point. I know this is a ton of information. Lots of pathways, lots of moving molecules. Uh, best thing I can say to help you learn this, mnemonics and drawing the structures. Even though on the test, I will not ask you to draw the structures, by doing the motion with your hand of drawing stuff, it will better connect it to your brain. So I think drawing structures will help a lot when going through these pathways. And maybe investing in a whiteboard so you don't use a bunch of paper. If you abbreviate the enzymes on the exam board, we still get credit. Yes, you can abbreviate the enzymes. That's 100% fine if you misspell the enzyme names. And if you're close enough, that's fine. Abbreviations are just fine and dandy with me. All right, so I'm gonna switch PowerPoints. Now, I know we only have 15 minutes left. So this PowerPoint is gonna take me way longer than 15 minutes. Therefore, you are the first to know it. No reading guide. First day. Those of you who took biochem with me last semester, this 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 isn't too foreign to you. But um, I'm gonna push the folders back because getting through this PowerPoint is probably gonna take me most of Thursday. Um, so no reading guide Thursday. If you have already done it, that's awesome. And I'll make that announcement as well. All right, review time. Just to make sure we know glycolysis. Just to make sure we still have it in our mind. And at the very least, to force you to go back and look at glycolysis in your notes. I do have a poll. Give it up. Which reactions of glycolysis are reactions in which we capture energy? So take this moment to go and refresh yourself on glycolysis. All right, so let's see here. 
Got one and three and seven and 10. Um, so some things to remember about glycolysis. It's broken into two phases, right? Remember phase one, you're putting in energy. Phase two, you get energy out. So like the first four steps of glycolysis is energy being put into the system. So anything that's early on in glycolysis will never create energy. Even the first step, right? Glucose to glucose six phosphate. We are adding a phosphate, right? So that phosphate is coming from ATP, ADP. So what we really want to remember when looking at this, is there any places where, you know, we have something named phosphate and that name's going away or it's reducing the number of phosphates. And we have that in two different positions. Look at step seven. We're going from a bisphosphate. Remember bisphosphate means two phosphates. The one and the three is telling you where in the molecule. So we have phosphate at one position, phosphate at three position. And we're just going to a three phosphate now, which means we lost the phosphate. And that phosphate is making ATP. Same with step 10. We went from phosphoenolpyruvate just to pyruvate. We lost the word phosphate. So that phosphate had to go somewhere and we're not gonna waste a good phosphate. Phosphates are too delicious. So seven and 10 are energy steps, but that's not the best answer. The best answer is D because in D we make NADH. Although we didn't really talk about it yet, when you make NADH, one of the things that can do is that can go to oxidative phosphorylation and make ATP down the line. So even though it doesn't make ATP directly, right? Always remember NADH can be used to make ATP later on. So that was just a little reminder of glycolysis, make you go and and, and think about uh, what we've covered so far. Also another good uh, example of uh, a potential test question there. Okay, what we're gonna talk about at the very beginning here, and let's see. Okay, so I might save the actual pathway um, for Thursday. I might just talk about, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna introduce the pathway. And then on Thursday, that's when we're gonna go into the nitty gritty of it. So, because instead of like splitting it up. But the next pathway we're gonna talk about is called the pentose phosphate pathway. And the pentose phosphate pathway is a shoot off of glycolysis. So it's another way that we can use the intermediates of glycolysis for something else. And the idea here is that glycolysis makes ATP. ATP is the energy for doing things, but ATP is not the only molecule that is useful to the cell for making stuff. Something else that is very reuseful for us are these molecules that carry electrons. Here, we care about NADPH. The P is phosphate. And do not get this confused with NADH. They are separate molecules. You can never take NADPH and make NADH. They are, they are separate. And what NADPH is used for is called reductive biosynthesis. Um, that name might seem intimidating. It's just really, we're doing redox reactions and we're making stuff. So we're making stuff via redox reactions.
And the way your body generally makes NADPH is that we take glucose 6-phosphate and instead of sending that through glycolysis, we're going to send that to another series of enzymes. So we take glucose, we phosphorylate it, and then we just say, I'm going to take this and I'm going to use it to make NADPH instead of ATP. This is called the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, some other books, some other people, if you're starting from the M cat, you might see this as the hexose monophosphate shunt, same thing. And this pathway is mainly used in those tissues that make lipids a lot. So your liver will do this, mammary glands, uh, adipose or fat tissue, adrenal cortex. Um, these things have these, I have a high concentration of these enzymes, so they do this pathway a lot. And actually 30% of all the glucose oxidation in your liver is really just used for this purpose. It's not used for energy, it's used to make NADPH so we can make other molecules, nucleotides and fats. So this will be the last, uh, yeah, this will be the last uh, slide of today. I'm just gonna introduce it. Then on Thursday, we're gonna break it down uh, of this pentose phosphate pathway. And the reaction is, we take three molecules. So we need three molecules to do a complete turn. Three molecule of glucose 6-phosphate. We put in three molecules of NADP and we get out six molecules of NADPH, two F6P and a GAP molecule. And just looking at this, one, two, Okay, just wanted to count that in my head. And this has three different stages that we'll break down. Stage one is taking glucose 6-phosphate and making uh, ribulose 5-phosphate. Uh, this is irreversible. So stage one only has one way. So as soon as you do the first reaction to make your lactone, that glucose 6-phosphate cannot directly go back into glycolysis. And it's, the images is trying to show that by like showing these like triple arrows thing that's like not reversible at all. It only goes one direction. Phase two, which is reversible, which you can see by all the double arrowheads in every single reaction. We're taking this ribulose and we're gonna change it into a cellulose or a ribose. So phase two, the cutoff for phase two is basically just this. That's just phase two. Um, different color. This is phase one. And then the rest of it is phase three. That's three. Um, where we're going to take two molecules of xylulose, one molecule of ribose, and we're going to make two molecules of fructose 6 phosphate and one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Um, we'll talk all about this. We'll talk about the logic of this, um, but we've gone over a lot of pathways. So we will save this for Thursday. We will finish this PowerPoint on Thursday. No new reading guide. Um, but yeah, any questions? There will be a homework for, for today, though. But any questions about anything people might have? When is our first exam? Um, that should be on the syllabus. Let me check. Somebody have that answer in two weeks, the 16th. Mm -hmm. 
Yep, Feb 16th. So exactly two weeks from now. So what we go over on Thursday might be the last stuff for the exam. I don't know. Um, I will have to see what I did last semester, how I split that up. Any other questions? All right, well, I hope this was informative. I know it's a lot, a lot to memorize, a lot of structures, um, but do it a little bit at a time every single day and um, you will get it. it. This was super intimidating to me when I did this. It was super intimidating to me the first time I taught it too, uh, knowing all this stuff. Um, but like anything, you will get it with practice. So just keep at it, don't despair. And with that, if you have any questions, want tutoring, anything at all, please email me as always. Otherwise, I'll see you Thursday. Thanks for stopping by.